Thursday, April 18th, 1912. Across the globe, telegraphs are rattling non-stop and newspapers run with a dramatic headline. Incredibly, it seems that the White Star Line's newest and finest liner has sunk with an enormous loss of life. At first, stories had come out about some kind of incident, but that all was well. Titanic was still afloat, and her passengers were being transferred to other ships. The wireless communiques between ship and shore had got garbled, mistranslated, and within days, news began to spread that the ship was actually now at the bottom of the ocean, but there was precious little else. Friends and relatives gathered out the front of the White Star Line offices on both sides of the Atlantic, from Liverpool and London to New York City, just waiting for any news. It soon became clear to an anxious public that the fact was Titanic was lost, and everybody who had made it off alive were loaded aboard a single, utilitarian rescue ship, RMS Carpathia. That modest Cunard ocean liner had found itself at the centre of one of the biggest news stories of the century, but aboard the ship a strict code of respectful quiet had been enforced. Little official news was being transmitted for fear of spreading misinformation or sensationalism. As Carpathia approached New York, the world held its breath. What had happened that chilling, clear night on the North Atlantic? Who were among the living and the dead? That Thursday evening, under a heavy rainfall, Carpathia slowly came into sight as she passed the Statue of Liberty and manoeuvred herself to dock. The following days would bring the full gamut of human emotion. Extraordinary relief and boundless grief, even unbridled rage. This was the wake of a tragedy. It was Carpathia's sad arrival. It was April 14th, 1912, and Carpathia was steaming east, three days out of New York. She was bound for Fiume in Austria-Hungary, carrying 743 passengers and 240 crew. This was meant to be a routine crossing for the ship, and her complement had enjoyed some quiet, sleepy days at sea, but then there had come that terrible news, the frantic distress calls, and then that wild dash through the night to arrive at the scene of a tragedy. Instead of finding a damaged ocean liner, the ship's complement were mortified to see only small wooden lifeboats. Sick, injured, shell-shocked, and unable to process what they'd just experienced, survivors of the Titanic had graciously accepted the aid rendered by Carpathia's crew and passengers. Some survivors had been lucky enough to be offered a cabin by a member of Carpathia's complement, but due to the limited accommodations available on the rather small ship, many more needed to make do in the ship's common rooms, resting on makeshift beds and in armchairs. Carpathia's commander, Captain Arthur Rostron, had decided not to remain on scene any longer, nor to make for the nearest landfall, Halifax. Instead, he turned his ship back for New York, where he knew Titanic's survivors had originally been bound. For the survivors, it had been an horrific night. In the early hours of the morning, Titanic had taken her last dying breath, the myth of the unsinkable ship, shattering like glass. In the same spot where there had once been a mighty ocean liner, there was now little left but a smattering of lifeboats floating in a debris field, and a haunting, smoky haze left floating on the water's surface. The inky black ocean erupted with splashing and clamouring, the screams of those fighting for their lives echoed in all directions. Titanic's second officer Charles Lytoller recalled that it was an utter nightmare of both sight and sound. Over the following hour, the noise grew more and more faint. Each voice silenced meant another life taken by the cold. The eerie quiet that washed over the lifeboats was only occasionally broken by the cries of a new widow or a child realising they had lost a parent. The night stretched on like this, with no apparent end in sight, but as dawn broke at last, lights were spotted on the horizon. Carpathia had arrived, having made full steam through the night to reach Titanic's last known position. One by one, the lifeboats and the survivors they held were hauled aboard and the delirious passengers were offered food, medicine, blankets and warm clothes. They were given a place to sleep and, most importantly, they had the promise of tomorrow. Onto Carpathia stepped Mr. J. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Line. He had assumed control of the company after his father's death, and he had been committed to continuing his lasting legacy. Titanic and her sister ships were Ismay's dream, a passion project he'd overseen for three years. As a custom, he would always travel on his ship's first crossings, 
But then there had come the horror of the sinking. He'd assisted loading lifeboats and getting passengers away before he himself stepped into a boat when the area of the deck he was working in had become unusually empty as passengers tried to escape elsewhere. He had turned his back as the ship took her dying plunge, but one could almost imagine the sounds as Titanic tore herself apart and Ismay's passengers died by their hundreds would have been just as traumatizing. Ismay, when he arrived on Carpathia, was like a ghost, pale white, shaking, almost unable to speak. Andrews, his close collaborator from the Highland and Wolf shipyard, had been lost. So too Smith, Titanic's commander. Ismay had actually been planning on retiring in December that year. Before joining Titanic, he had written that he was looking forward to good weather, shooting, and a happy retirement, but he also noted, rather ominously, that June 1913 is a far cry, and much may happen between now and then. He could not have known how prophetic these words were. Now confronted in the early morning light by the sight of hundreds of cold, grief-stricken passengers and crew, Ismay was led quietly away and sat alone, looking into nothing. First-class passenger Jack Thayer later recalled that he was staring straight ahead, shaking all over like a leaf. Even when I spoke to him, he paid absolutely no attention. I've never seen a man so completely wrecked. Rostron, Carpathia's concerned commander, described him as mentally very ill at the time. At 8am, with the rescue still ongoing, Ismay was sedated by Carpathia's doctor, but he'd written a message to be passed on via wireless to New York. It simply said, Deeply regret advise you Titanic sank this morning after collision with an iceberg, resulting in serious loss of life. The message was possibly too curt. Rostron and his ship's purser advised Ismay to add further particulars later as a postscript. It wasn't sent right away. In fact, it only reached the New York White Star office two days later because it was instead buried under a pile of passenger correspondence as survivors desperately sought to tell their loved ones that they were okay. In New York, there had at first been unease as reports came through that something was wrong with the liner. These days we're accustomed to finding out news within minutes as it breaks, with a constantly refreshing feed available right at our fingertips, but of course, in 1912, news moved much slower, and there was far more opportunity for headlines to become sensationalised or completely garbled. Such was the case as the news began to spread of Titanic sinking. The first headlines were optimistic, claiming that the Titanic had suffered a collision at sea, but that all passengers were reportedly safe, transferred onto other ships for the remainder of their journey into New York. The public could breathe a sigh of relief. There had been no danger to life, and the greatest concern would be making arrangements for a possible late arrival. These reports led to the understanding that passengers had been transferred off of the damaged Titanic onto the ships Virginian and Parisian, and they were due to arrive in Halifax. A special train was then actually dispatched to pick up survivors who'd be docking in Halifax, but once word spread of a New York arrival, the train turned back around. This was only the beginning of the rampant confusion in the aftermath of the disaster. White Star officials themselves even remained shockingly ignorant of the truth. Philip Franklin, the Vice President of the White Star Line and the General Manager of the International Mercantile Marine, released a statement after being bombarded with visits and phone calls from concerned families in New York. Assuring the anxious public that there was no cause for concern, he said, while we are not in direct communication with the Titanic, we're perfectly satisfied that the ship is unsinkable. That no more wireless messages are coming from the ship may be due to atmospheric conditions or something like that. The ship is reported to have gone down several feet by the head. This may be due to water filling the forward compartment and the ship may go down many feet by the head and still keep afloat for an indefinite period. For many, this statement must have come as a massive relief. If something like that would come right from the shipping company's management, it was easy to believe that there was no real danger. But throughout the following morning, reports began to look more and more bleak. A front page feature in the New York Times read, New Liner Titanic hits an iceberg sinking by the bow at midnight, women put off in lifeboats, last wireless at 12.27 a.m. blurred. Now initially, this much more fatalistic headline was seen as sensationalism, but back in the day of Marconi Wireless, news travelled differently because wireless telegraphs weren't transmitting on specific channels for only certain people to hear. Any Marconi Wireless message could be picked up at any Marconi Wireless station. This meant that the New York Times had actually picked up Titanic's distress calls themselves, translated them, 
and then got the headline ready to print within hours. They had heard the tragic news from Titanic herself, and it became increasingly clear that the early reports of the situation had been severely understating reality, likely because they themselves had misinterpreted the wireless messages. Once the news was confirmed, and other papers picked up on the story, there could be no more denying it. The world came to a standstill with the printing of one unforgettable headline, Titanic sinks with great loss of life. The scope of the situation began to drive home and by midnight, White Star Vice President Franklin was interviewed again, but this time he openly wept. I thought her unsinkable, he said, and I based my opinion on the best expert advice. I do not understand it. The question quickly turned to the identities of those lost. Survivalists were posted, and families flocked to the front steps of the White Star offices in New York and London, desperate to know the whereabouts of their loved ones. These lists, assembled on board Carpathia and then transmitted via Marconi Wireless, were, much like early reports of the disaster, absolutely riddled with inaccuracies. Some families were informed that their loved ones had died, the grief hit hard, but then, to their pure amazement, they learned that the reports had proved incorrect. Others, whose loved ones were lost, had been told that they had in fact survived, offering them false hope. It was confusion on all sides, with no answer in sight. The only thing to do was to await the arrival of the rescue ship Carpathia into New York City, and let the world see once and for all what remained of the once great Titanic. It would be days before the ship would arrive, and in the meantime the world held its breath as information continued to slowly trickle in. Carpathia had experienced fine weather no days at sea out of New York, but then, as if to mock her efforts, the Atlantic put on a show of thick fog and heavy rain squalls to delay her return as long as possible. The ship forged ahead with an atmosphere on board that could only be described as funereal. In first class, some of the more illustrious Titanic passengers sat talking over breakfast. It became clear that the survivors would need to pull their own weight and to recognise Rostron and his crew for their incredible gallantry. The leader of this initiative was Margaret Brown, Maggie to her friends, incorrectly recorded in the history books since, as Molly Brown. Margaret suggested forming a survivors committee to reward Rostron and see to the welfare of the second and third class passengers on board. The committee would eventually amass over $10,000 total to compensate Carpathia's crew and to reward Rostron with a special gift once they arrived in New York. But arguably, the more important work done by the committee was that to do with survivor relief. It was given its own dedicated subcommittee, speaking with second and third class survivors and taking lists of their basic needs. They also offered counselling for five hours a day. Passengers came in their scores to ease the mental burden they carried, but they also raised practical concerns. How could they proceed on to their intended destinations throughout America with no money, many having lost all of their possessions when Titanic sank? Brown and the committee promised to take the matter to Bruce Ismay and he promised to provide arrangements for connections from New York to wherever they needed to go, via train or private car. Others were motivated by all this work. Originally they were stunned by the horrific experience, but then many got to work helping cut and sew new clothes out of blankets. While survivors rested, exhausted and weary, in Carpathia's wireless room the two telegraph operators worked around the clock to send correspondence as best they could. But Carpathia had set to sea with just one operator, Harold Cottam. Remarkably, he was the one who'd worked all night to coordinate Titanic's rescue, and then, the morning of the recovery, he was face to face with an unexpected guest, his friend and Titanic's junior wireless operator, Harold Bride. At just 22 years of age, the maiden voyage of Titanic was to be Bride's seventh round trip voyage, as part of the Marconi International Marine Company, where he'd just been hired less than a year earlier. Bride had shown a fascination with Marconi's wireless telegraph device starting from a very young age, and at one point he was said to have knocked together his own transmitter and antenna. He had almost died as Titanic went down, stuck beneath an overturned lifeboat and immersed in the freezing water, but upon rescue Bride reported dutifully to help work in Carpathia's Marconi room. The sheer volume of outgoing telegraphs meant for worried families at home had overwhelmed Cotton, so despite severely frostbitten legs and feet, Bride set about working his way through the seemingly never-ending pile of messages, and the two friends got to work. Titanic survivors tried to get what little rest they could, some wrapped up in clothes fashioned from steamer rugs, 
numbing the pain with drams of brandy. The weather, meanwhile, had taken a nasty turn. The sea kicked up to a terrible chop and heavy rain pounded the ship, alarming the already traumatised survivors. Titanic passenger Imanita Shelley remembered feeling as though the sea devils were evidently mad at the idea of any of us escaping their clutches. Lawrence Beasley wrote that the Carpathia returned to New York in almost every kind of climactic condition, listing ice fields, freezing rain, moments of brilliant sun, thunder and lightning, cold wind, fog, and thick sea spray. All on board were desperate to get home, but even once they had landed, comfort would still be a long way off. The world that every person on board had left behind when they set off on their journey was not the world they were about to return to. After three days at sea, Carpathia slowly steamed into the channel entrance at Lower Bay that would take her into New York. From the sky, countless raindrops fell as if nature itself was shedding a tear for Titanic survivors. They crowded the railings, stunned into silence by the ghostly sight of the Statue of Liberty as it slipped past them. 172 third-class passengers aboard Carpathia had set out excitedly from their home just one week ago on Titanic to see this very sight. The welcome of a new life, the promise of a happier existence, but now more than 700 of their friends, family and shipmates weren't there to see it with them. Nobody knew quite what to expect once the ship had docked, but for now, like their loved ones at home, there was little more to do but wait and wonder what was coming for them once they arrived in America. One passenger on board reported overhearing a conversation between two immigrants. I have nothing in the world and I have no place to go since my husband is lost, one woman said, but I'm not afraid. I've always heard that the Americans were the kindest people in the world. Other survivors, in their own varied states of shock and grief, seem to be processing their experiences in more unexpected ways. Bertha Mulverhill, an Irish third-class passenger, wrote a letter to her sister while on board Carpathia, in what would appear to be a severe state of shock. Dear Maud, she began, experience is great, I'm fine and dandy, never better. What time did you hear of the dreadful disaster? I am so glad I was in it, I shall never forget it. Don't think me mad for being so happy to witness the sight, I am with a jolly crowd in this old ship, I am awfully happy, like the night I was born, never felt happier in my life. I have nothing to worry. Sounding more like a cheerful vacationer than the survivor of the world's greatest shipping disaster, Mulverhill's letter was just one example of how trauma, exhaustion, shock, and pure relief had begun to take some kind of toll on Titanic's few survivors. Small steamboats had taken to the water, chartered by journalists eager to be the first ones to catch the scoop firsthand from the survivors of the Titanic disaster. Once the ship was in sight, the blinding lights of flashbulbs lit up her hull and just like that, the media circus was in full swing. Flares were used for extra lighting by photographers, turning night briefly into day. Journalists called out to passengers on board, desperate to interview anyone who might give them the time of day before the survivors had even disembarked. The most story-hungry among them even attempted to board the ship, either through bribery or brute force. Carpathia's Captain Rostron picked up his megaphone and shouted that anybody who tried it would be shot down. One journalist actually succeeded in his plans, but was immediately apprehended and held by Captain Rostron on the bridge until the ship docked. But despite all these security measures, there would apparently be no escaping predatory journalism. A passenger travelling on board Carpathia was a man by the name of Carlos Hurd. He was a reporter for the St. Louis Dispatch, and as a journalist, he was keen to recognise the opportunity wherever and whenever it appeared. Now, once word had spread that Carpathia was to be acting as a rescue ship for Titanic, Heard realised he'd just been handed the story of a lifetime. It wouldn't come easy though, Captain Rostron and the ship's crew were fully aware of Heard's occupation, and were similarly aware of the need for privacy among the traumatised and exhausted survivors. The captain and crew all went to great lengths to ensure that Heard and his wife Catherine would not be able to use the survivors' tragic situation for their own gain. Their stationery was removed from their cabin, and stewards were ordered to routinely check for any signs that the couple had been compiling notes. But despite all those safeguards, the two had still managed to conduct several interviews and begged fellow passengers for paper and writing utensils along the way. Catherine had kept the notes pinned to the inside of her corset and her petticoat to ensure the work would remain concealed. Meanwhile, in New York, Charles Chapin, editor for the newspaper The New York World, quickly made arrangements to charter a boat to await Carpathia's arrival, and as the ship made her way into the harbour, Heard took the reports and interviews collected by he and his wife 
wrapped them up in a makeshift waterproof package, and hurled it overboard to Chapin. With this, the very first accounts of the Titanic rescue were as good as published. Despite scores of story-hungry journalists, photographers with their incessant flashing cameras and anxious onlookers all waiting to learn the full story, Carpathia still had one final sombre task to attend to before her journey was properly over. The crowd of over 10,000 people looked on in confusion as Carpathia slowly passed right by her own berth at Cunard Pier 54 where she was meant to dock and instead proceeded to White Star Line's Pier 59. It was here that the 13 of Titanic's lifeboats that had been recovered were unceremoniously offloaded, a grim and eerie reminder of the tragedy that had just taken place. It was a chilling sight. Titanic had set off from Southampton just a week prior in all her splendour and glory, and now, instead of the beautiful liner sitting at the dock, there were only these tiny wooden boats and the survivors that had managed to escape in them. With this grim task now behind her, Carpathia made her way back to Pier 54 and finally, after enduring the most gruelling ordeal of their lives, it was almost time for the Titanic survivors to once again set foot on dry land. By this time, the crowds of onlookers had swelled in size to 30,000 people. Some were friends, family and loved ones of those on board, but others merely wanted to bear witness to history unfolding despite the chill and the heavy rain. A strong police presence had been ordered for crowd control, and 35 ambulances were posted around the pier from each and every hospital in New York City. At 9.30pm, Carpathia had finally docked at the Cunard Pier, and the first order of business was for Carpathia's ticketed passengers to make their way off the ship. This was a protective measure put in place by Captain Rostron, who predicted that the press would swarm at the sight of any shell-shocked survivors. For Carpathia's passengers, who had set out for the Mediterranean a week earlier, it was probably one of the most surreal experiences of their lives. First-class passengers, Dr. Henry Frauenthal and his wife Clara, were reportedly the first of Titanic survivors to disembark. As they stepped onto the gangway, a hush fell over the crowd. They were quickly escorted through and into a waiting car, where they were whisked away from the prying eyes of the press. Following the Frauenthals, the other first-class passengers began to file off the ship, in varying stages of exhaustion and dishevelment, most in their pyjamas or makeshift clothing. Many passengers needed to be carried down the gangway due to the extent of their injuries. They were loaded into ambulances and driven off to various hospitals throughout the city for treatment. Second and third class passengers followed, many of whom collapsed into the arms of waiting family members or policemen as the shock finally wore off. Lastly, the few surviving members of Titanic's crew trundled off. Of the 900 men and women who had signed on to work on board Titanic during the maiden voyage, only 214 had survived. Photographs show grinning crew met with relief by loved ones, a small glimmer of happiness at an otherwise confronting scene. The Central News reported, Some of the scenes at the pier were indescribably affecting. Husbands meeting their rescued wives clung to them and kissed them tenderly. Many women were in a hysterical condition. There was a pathetic procession of sick and injured who were carried on stretchers to hospital. Passengers and crew were met by the city's relief and aid organisations who had sent their members to distribute food and clothing. The Women's Aid Committee, the Travellers Aid Society, the Council of Jewish Women, the Salvation Army, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society and the Red Cross all did their part, providing accommodation for the listless or medical attention for the sick and the injured. The Red Cross began to deal with the sudden influx of donations from across the United States and overseas. Tens of thousands of dollars which poured in and had to be distributed among Titanic's passengers and crew. One crewman in particular became the man of the hour as far as the press was concerned. Harold Bride had been a key witness to the disaster, assisting in the transmission of those crucial wireless distress calls, but he was not among the number of crew who disembarked Titanic that night. Remarkably, the 24-year-old had elected to stay on board Carpathia, which still continued to transmit messages in huge volumes. On the dock, reporters clamoured to get an interview with Titanic's lone wireless man, but it was the New York Times that would strike a deal with none other than the head of the Marconi International Mercantile Marine Communication Company, Googly Elmo Marconi himself, to secure Bride's story. Marconi was naturally Bride's hero. He stepped aboard Carpathia that same night alongside New York Times reporter Jim Spears. 
As the two men entered the wireless room, Bride was so focused on his work that he didn't even look up from the machine. Seeing the opportunity to surprise the young man tapping away at the telegraph, Marconi took a moment to listen into the messages Bride had been sending out, and then, after a pause, he commented, That's hardly worth sending out now, boy. The words snapped Bride out of his trance, and when he turned to look around, he was face to face with his childhood hero. Marconi extended a warm handshake, thanked Bride for his work, and then offered his condolences on the loss of his colleague, Titanic's chief radio operator Jack Phillips. He then introduced Bride to Spears, the reporter accompanying him, and informed Bride that if he wanted to tell his story, the Times was prepared to pay him the equivalent of $16,000 in today's money. Bride would be a fool to say no to the offer and refuse his hero, so he eagerly agreed, and the next day his story was published in a five-column front-page piece in the New York Times. His work finally done, Bride was carried bodily off the ship, his feet bandaged tightly. Meanwhile, J. Bruce Ismay had no idea what kind of nightmare he was just about to endure. As news had slowly filtered through of Titanic's loss, Franklin, the New York-based vice president of the White Star Line, had sent a few messages through to Ismay after he'd been revived from his catatonic state. Franklin knew that he and Ismay were in deep trouble because the story was about to get out of control. As Carpathia approached New York, Franklin messaged concise Marconigram of actual accident needed for enlightenment public and ourselves. This is most important. But Ismay's response was buried by a message blackout instituted by Carpathia's Captain Rostron, which ensured that only Marconigrams telling family members their loved ones were safe were being transmitted with any urgency. Franklin's attempts to get ahead of the story had failed, and what messages from Ismay had been transmitted detail his request for the White Star Line of Cedric to be made ready to repatriate Ismay and Titanic's crew as soon as possible. These messages were picked up by the US Navy, and they were handed on to a senator, William Alden Smith, who had other plans for the White Star Line chairman. He waited with a small party of detectives at the New York Pier as Carpathia docked. Ismay had issued instructions upon arrival in New York that no international mercantile marine ships were to sail without a sufficient number of lifeboats for every person on board. The rest of the industry quickly followed suit, but as Ismay made preparations to disembark Carpathia, there was a polite knock on his stateroom door, and in stepped Philip Franklin with fresh clothes and some bad news. In barge senators William Alden Smith and Francis Newlands, Ismay was told he would not be departing home, Aboard Cedric, instead he would need to appear at a hastily convened Senate inquiry beginning the very next morning. Escorted by detectives, Ismay at last left Carpathia, and with Franklin gave his first statement, which began, In the presence and under the shadow of a catastrophe so overwhelming, my feelings are too deep for expression in words. Ismay was subjected to intense scrutiny by both the media and the American inquiry, and it would not go in his favour. His old nemesis, William Randolph Hearst, ran the nation's largest newspaper chain. He leapt at the opportunity to orchestrate Ismay's downfall. American papers ran sensational headlines, and White Star's chairman was nicknamed J. Brute Ismay for daring to save himself. The damage was done, and his reputation could never recover. As Ismay, Bride, and the other Titanic crew members sat in the Waldorf Astoria, answering Senator Smith's questions back out on the open ocean, Grim work was being done. The cable-laying ship Mackay Bennett was one of four vessels tasked with recovering Titanic's dead. The vessel set out from Halifax and began to search for any signs of the victims, and precious few were found, a little over 330 of the 1,496 people lost. Their personal items were catalogued in detail, but many were buried at sea. The rich and the poor were brought on board and examined. These were Titanic's silent witnesses, those who could never give their testimony. Hundreds still were never found. Captain Smith, Thomas Andrews, and many, many more. In Belfast, the town that had created Titanic, the outpouring of sorrow from the men who'd actually driven home her iron rivets by hand was deeply moving. At Southampton, where three quarters of Titanic's crew had called home, there was an intense grief that gripped the population. And at Liverpool, lists of the rescued had to be read from the balconies of the White Star Line office because the crowds were so furious. Still, thanks to Carpathia's efforts, more than 700 people arrived in New York alive to meet their loved ones in America or to return home to Europe and Britain. For Rostron and the crew of Carpathia, it had been a whirlwind week. Their seamanship had been pushed to the absolute limit the night they rushed to Titanic's rescue. 
they'd almost hit an iceberg themselves. In a story with many perceived villains, Rostron emerged as one of the heroes. Filmed on the decks of his ship, he gave curt interviews and gave little away. But then he was surprised by Margaret Brown. The Survivor Committee's funds had commissioned bronze medallions for his crew commemorating their efforts and for a spectacular silver cup for their captain. She presented it to Rostron in front of news cameramen, and Rostron was also showered with medals from the US government for his valour. But when the captain later cast his mind back to the night of April 14th and the following morning, he simply said, When day broke, I saw the eye side steam through during the night, I shuddered and could only think that some other hand than mine was on that helm during the night. 17-year-old Jack Thayer had tried to comfort Ismay to no avail after Titanic sank, even though he had lost his own father in the sinking. Overwhelmed by the media response, the frantic news cameraman and the volumes of newspaper reports and media sensationalism, Thayer reflected nearly 30 years later on the world the Titanic disaster left in its wake. There was peace and the world had an even tenor to its way, he said. Nothing was revealed in the morning, the trend of which was not known the night before. It seems to me that the disaster about to occur was the event that not only made the world rub its eyes and awake, but woke it with a start, keeping it moving at a rapidly accelerating pace ever since, with less and less peace, satisfaction and happiness. To my mind, the world of today awoke on April 15th, 1912.